Hey everyone, I'm Natalie Bensavanga. And I'm Leanne Jamira, and welcome to the season finale of Heating Up. That's right, this is the show that explores the intersection between the foods that we love to make and the conversations that we need to be having around social justice and climate change. So sit back and relax. <laughs> We're making a cake for the last episode of this season mm -hmm. to commemorate how far we've come, mm -hmm. the amazing guests we've spoken to, mm -hmm. and how much we've learned on this journey about the environment, about climate change, and about all the things that we as individuals and as communities can do to save our planet. That's right, and you know what's been great is everybody can make a plant-based meal and help reduce their carbon footprint and feel good at the same time. So it's been a nice way to sort of introduce people mm. to this uh, you know, activism while not actually feeling like you're out of your element. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and what better way to do that than a cake? Yes. Everyone loves cake. <laughs> um, so what we're gonna be doing today is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. I actually don't even really measure the ingredients at home when I'm making this cake, but Today, we're going to measure them out for you guys. First, we start with the wet ingredients, mm -hmm. and today I'm going to boss Natalie around. I love this, okay. We're going to take um, one and a half cups of sugar, mm -hmm. and then one and a half cups of butter. I know that this isn't that yeah, much this is butter. Just, these are just for show, guys. But, this is TV magic happening here. But we're going to mix those two things together, mm -hmm. cream them together, and then we're going to add in lemon, six flax eggs and it's very simple to make a flax egg it's one tablespoon of ground flax seeds and then two to three tablespoons of water you mm -hmm. let it sit for a while and it gets like really Almost gooey spongy yeah like jello it's, yeah it's gelatinous um it's a fun word yeah it is <laughs> and then we're also going to add in vanilla extract did you catch all of that if not the recipe is underneath so I don't even need to say it. <laughs> and then once all of that is mixed together, we add in our dry ingredients. We add in four cups of flour. So you want the batter to be like fluffy and firm. Mm. Um, and it's sort of, it's not gonna look the way that you think it's supposed to look. It's a surprise cake. It, yeah, because also with vegan baking, mm -hmm. like all the stuff that you made when you were little with your mom, mm -hmm. you're used to the way that the batters smell and look and feel. And this, because of the flax eggs, and also because sometimes the vegan butters are different and they have different chemistries or whatever it is, the smell is a little bit different. It's more like nutty mm. or earthy rather yeah. than like that sickening sweet smell. Mm -hmm. We're going to take, I think it's four tablespoons or four teaspoons mm -hmm. of baking powder and then um, about two teaspoons of salt or a teaspoon of salt. I'm really excited to make this recipe with you. Um, so we took the cake out of the oven. It's cooled. It's ready to be decorated. Um, the reason why it's green, I forgot to mention before we started, was that we used spinach puree, which is just putting spinach and water in the blender. I mean, we actually ran out, so that's why this one is green and this one is not green. I like it because um, you can really see the different colors here, right? It can also be covered in icing. Yeah, so a little extra spinach cares? is good for you. So we have all kinds of fun decorations here. So if you're a person that loves icing, who doesn't love icing? You can get store-bought icing, you can make your own icing, which is really easy to do. And then we have some other accoutrements, if you will, right? Yeah, Topics we're gonna, I love cake decorating, so we're gonna make this one really fancy. It's the last episode, you guys, we have to go all out. You guys, we just finished icing oh. this cake. Um, Gorgeous. I envisioned what this would look like in my mind last night before I went to sleep. <laughs> and what do you this think is now my life? dream coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, this is me seeing the fruits of my labor. <laughs> um, and it is a little bit emotional for me. I think that that's a, yeah. uh, a metaphor for what we're feeling as this is the last episode. Yeah. So we are going to cut this. We are going mm -hmm. to try it. Mm -hmm. I think that we should try it before we give it to the guests because I don't. I agree. If this is bad, it's I not going to be bad. You've made this cake before. This is your special cake. This is my special cake. It's Leandra's cake, magical but... cake, you know? It's her magical moss cake. Okay, where do you think, where do you want me to This cut is it great. Okay. Oh, and can you explain what these are? Because oh, yeah, this so is really this is cool. Actually, these, a lot of the stuff is from my garden. Mm -hmm. The raspberries and strawberries are not because they aren't in season yet. 
but the pineapple sage is a um, herb that I grow in my garden that pollinators love. It has beautiful mm. red flowers, and it's called mm. pineapple sage because it smells like pineapple. Um, Sarah, it really can does. Confirm that for you. <laughs> and then this is a strawberry flower from my garden. That means I'm gonna get one less strawberry for you guys, or for myself and my family. So is that technically that's the strawberry? strawberry? Yeah. I didn't know that. The I love that. Oh wow, this is like so thick. Okay. That is so good. Mm. I know. It's so, it's not too sweet. It's, it's like cornbread. Like it's literally so simple. And mm. then you add the icing. Mm. Yeah. Well, working with you was really the icing on my cake for this experience. And you know, I wouldn't want to have any other moment to end this mm -hmm. than having this cake to celebrate mm -hmm. with our very special last guest. Yes. And my very special Aww. friend. Oh, this was so, so bonding. We'll see you guys at the conversation. We'll enjoy this cake together. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Hey everybody. We are so excited to have Richard Piacentini. Mm -hmm. Did I say that already? Did you like that? You have to ask him, not me. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the best last name. name, right? That's the best last name with us from Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Garden. Now, I know things look a little different for our last show, just but just a little bit, just a little bit. But because of COVID, um, Richard has some stuff going on with family, and it was safer for him to uh, be Zooming with us today. But fear not, Leandra has already promised to deliver cake to him personally right after this. So I'm just going to hold you to it and. Uh, so, am I. <laughs> <laughs> so let's kick things off, Richard. Can you talk a little bit about um, your work with FIPS? How did you end up working at FIPS? Well, uh, first, let me thank you for inviting me to be on the show. And thank you for letting me join from my kitchen to yours. Um, you have a beautiful yeah. kitchen, by the way. It really does. It's oh, a thanks. beautiful kitchen. We should have been doing this entire show in yours. <laughs> <laughs> Next season. <laughs> okay. um, so, yeah, so I've been at Phipps since uh, 1994, mm -hmm. and I uh, was recruited to come here uh, from a, a garden that I was working in in Michigan, and it was when Phipps, it was right after Phipps first went private. Uh, it's, it's still owned by the city of Pittsburgh, but it's run by a nonprofit organization right now, and, uh, you know, I was, I was brought in to help um, uh, get the organization back on track and, and become a world-class botanical garden. Amazing. So when we're talking about botanical gardens, you know, how often have you been to Phipps in your life? I've never been to Phipps. <gasps> and it's, I actually said this when yes. we spoke, I have always wanted to go to Phipps. And I think I mentioned to you, oh, you know, I am. Um, have to do this. Phipps is like, to me, Phipps, ever since I moved here, and then ever since I started uh, environmental organizing, mm -hmm. Phipps is the building and the institution that is constantly brought up. And mm. this show is an homage to Pittsburgh, essentially. And so it's really, really cool that we're sort of ending on this note mm -hmm. with Phipps being the focus, because this is like an institution of Pittsburgh that's known globally yeah. for its um, environmental advocacy and innovation. So could you tell us a little bit more about that as to why Pittsburgh is this huge, or FIPS is this huge staple for uh, environmental movements all over the world? Sure. So let me say, uh, first of all, you have to come to Phipps. I know. We're, we're, we're going to bring her, for sure. <laughs> and, um, I have to tell you that I can relate to that, too. You know, I was born in New York City and grew up right outside the city in Long, Long Island. And it was after I moved away from New York that I actually saw more of New York City than when I lived there. So, you know, sometimes you, uh, you don't see the things that are right in your own backyard. So I understand that. But that's not, I'm not letting you off the hook. We're going to get you <laughs> Uh, you have to give me a personal tour. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So our um, so how did we get known? Well, we've actually we didn't really start out on this journey when we went private. You know, when we first went private, we were really focused on um, trying to replace some of the dilapidated facilities that we had. Try to get a new entrance that was more visitor friendly. Try to improve some of the infrastructure uh, and the visitor stay time, things like that. And this was back in the late 1990s when something uh, LEED came out, which is the, the prominent um, 
green building certification program in the country right now. And it was just being launched. We were, we were talking to this architect. He told us about this new thing coming out called LEED. He told us how buildings account for about 40% of the energy and water we use, 40% of the pollution we produce. We had no idea. We said, wow, we, you know, we care about the environment. Why shouldn't our buildings reflect our values? And that was the thing that really got us start thinking about the impact that we have, the way we live on the environment and ultimately the climate. Uh, so that was the real uh, foray that we had into getting into this whole area. And then as the more we got into it, the more we decided to uh, you know, spread out this way of thinking about being more sustainable to things like our operations and our programs and our outreach programs. Uh, so it really just started to snowball to now where we have built what is considered to be uh, the greenest building in the world, our Center for Sustainable Landscapes. It's the only building in the world that's gotten seven of the top highest certifications all in one building. And we also have a number of other buildings that are also uh, very super green, high performance buildings. And I think we've really built our reputation on uh, those buildings, but I think it goes a lot more than that. I think what we're really focused on is uh, walking the talk and actually trying to make sure that everything we do, we're actually demonstrating that it is possible that we can do that. And I think that message is starting to spread with people around the world now too. So we what both ways, were thinking probably the same yeah, thought. Yeah, I was about to say, you know, what ways recently have you guys sort of walked the walk and done some things that, exactly, <laughs> done some things that show people how they can themselves live more sustainable lives? Mm -hmm. When we first opened our Welcome Center, which was the first LEED certified building in the public garden, uh, LEED said we had to use 20% electricity in that building that had to be renewable energy. And we said, well, why stop with 20%? Let's do 100%. And then we said, well, why stop with that building? Let's do a whole campus. So since 2005, all the electricity at Phipps has been is from renewable energy. 2006, right after we opened, we decided that uh, we didn't want to have any more plastic disposables in our cafe. So we got rid of all the plastic disposables. We've been doing that since 2006. In 2009, we stopped selling bottled water. You can't get bottled water at Phipps anymore. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we try to do too is to really take a long-term view. You know, it's very easy to look at, you know, focus on short-term. And if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna build this building, I'm gonna put these kinds of uh, sustainable, you know, investments into it, what's the payback? And then people start saying, well, I want to get my payback in two or three years. Well, that's, that's crazy. Um, we look at what's the long term, what's it going to be, what's, what's going to happen over 50 to 100 years. You know, Phipps has been around for over 100 years. We want it to be around for the next 100 years as well. So why shouldn't the investments we make now be the kind of things that put Phipps in the best position going forward for the next 100 years? If the investments we're making now, I'm not going to see the benefit of them. I mean, I'll be long gone by the time the benefit comes around, but I know the people who come after me, uh, they're not going to have to be raising a lot of money to do things like pay utility bills and things like that. They're going to be able to put their money they raise into programs for people in this community. And that's something that I think is a much, much greater uh, goal to have than just trying to get a payback in two to three years. That's a really powerful view mm -hmm. of doing things. And I think that's the most necessary way of viewing environmental uh, mm -hmm. legacy, I guess, is doing this for future generations. Because at this point, you know, we are seeing the effects of our actions and our past mm -hmm. actions, but we need to start moving in a direction that even we won't see the effects, but hopefully our great grandchildren and our great, 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 great grandchildren will see those effects and, and reap those benefits. So it's really, really refreshing to hear that there's an institution here in Pittsburgh that's doing that. And is, you were so casual about it. The greenest <laughs> building in the I world. I know, seriously. Like, oh, like no yeah. big deal. That was Whatever. so casual. I just wanted to reiterate that that's in Pittsburgh's backyard. Yep. Like we have that. And mm -hmm. yeah. So when you're talking about this with other community leaders, how do you convince them that this is the right thing to do long-term for both the environment and for their pocketbooks, because at the end of the day, you know, capitalism is a wasteful system. So how do you expand people's minds to letting them know that this is good for their bottom line down the road? Or, or can you? 
Well, you know, we certainly have started that conversation with people and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, we're creatures of habit. And a lot of people have been brought up with this mindset and this way of thinking that here's the way businesses operate. Here's, here's what good business looks like. This is what success looks like. Mm-hmm. And look where it's gotten us. I think we need to change well, how we determine success and how we determine profitability. You know, there's a, we've gotten very much involved in this idea of uh, regenerative thinking lately. And one of the t- key tenets of uh, regenerative thinking is there's a framework that talks about the five stakeholders. And the stakeholders are your investors, which in our case, they're donors. They're the users, which are your visitors or your, your uh, patrons. There's the community, there's your co-creators, which is your staff and volunteers, and then there's the planet Earth. A lot of times people just focus on the, the, the investors. They're just trying to make money for the investors. They might care a little bit about the, the, um, uh, the, the public or their customers, or they might care a little bit about the community. In regenerative thinking, we try to treat all five stakeholders equally. In everything we do, we try to make sure that we're addressing, we're giving equal value to all five of those investors. And that can, when you start to think like that, it changes the way you start thinking about how you're doing things and how you're operating and what success looks like. Because to be, for us to be successful, we have to make sure we're, we're, we're meeting all five of those stakeholders' needs. From your perspective, as you're watching things unfold nationally, globally, and just in the city of Pittsburgh and just our state, do you feel like we're moving in the right direction? And do you feel like we're taking enough action to truly combat climate change? Well, I don't think we're doing enough fast enough. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, and I think it, it's really gonna need to take a combination of uh, two things, two, two forces. It's gonna take a top down and a bottom up approach. We need better regulation. You know, we have the COP26 conference coming up uh, in, in November. We need our world leaders to take aggressive action to start making changes. But we also need to take a responsibility ourselves as individuals and communities and to start creating a groundswell of support. You know, our leaders can't make changes if they don't have a, we don't have their back. So we have to make sure that we're supporting the, the broad changes that need to happen as a community level, as an individual, and actually start doing some things individually as individuals to, to demonstrate that we're, we're serious about having this happen. I remember learning a little bit about the cafe at Phipps too, and you guys have become very vegetable forward. And was part of that thinking sort of along the lines, what we were thinking of just trying to give people that spark in their brains that they can enjoy food and also eat it that's gentle to the planet. Absolutely, that was a main focus of our, our uh, cafe. Right after we started our cafe, when we started our cafe, we wanted to focus on local and organic foods. And then as we got more involved in talking children's health and trying to think about children's health, we said to ourselves, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to talk about children's health. And then we serve junk in our cafe, junk food. So I think it was in 2011, we stopped selling soda and junk food in our cafe. All the food for all our kids' meals is organic and healthy. Uh, we right after that, it wasn't long after that, we started to do this veg forward idea where I think 90% of our cafe offerings are ve- either vegetarian or vegan. Now, people have the option that they could add in some tofu or, or salmon or chicken or something like that to it, but that's a choice that they can make. Where do you see Phipps positioning itself in the next 20 to 30 years? What are some new things that you're hoping to innovate upon or to improve upon within your building? In the space? Well, I think one of the things we're really focused on right now is trying to demonstrate the important connections between human health and environmental health. Mm -hmm. And that to me is really a key place where we can play an important role. You know, Mm -hmm. we're a botanical garden. We're all about the beauty of nature. We all try to get people inspired about the beauty of nature. We have become, as, as a society, we've become so disconnected from nature. You know, we live, spend 90% of our lives in buildings. Our buildings were designed to isolate us from nature. Uh, we think of nature as something you see when you go on vacation. Well, it's actually all around us, everywhere you look, right? We have to start recognizing we're not separate from nature, we're a part of nature. So the way we live, the way we interact with the world has a huge impact on our health and the environment. And the more we can, we can improve our lifestyles and our connections to nature, the better we're gonna impact we're going to have in both our health 
and the health of the planet. And that's what we're trying to demonstrate to people right now. Richard, we so appreciate you taking time to chat with us. So Leandra and I are definitely going to be coming to Phipps very soon. One, so she can just see the amazing space because it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. You're going to love it. And two, we'd love to be able to do something in that cafe together as well. Maybe we can have a cooking class or do something to really showcase um, all the benefits of vegan cooking and all of the fun things that we've made this season. So perhaps we'll be there to try one of those recipes out with you guys. What do you think? That'd be great. I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. Can't say no. Yeah. Totally. As he signs a restraining order. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us for Absolutely. our finale episode of Heating Up. Leandra has cake right, you know, right off uh, stage here. So we're going to go and eat it. And then don't be surprised if she does show up with some of it later for you. Just email your address. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Good day. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.